just like the supernova. In graphical terms, what you're doing is using two objects at different redshifts behind the same mass and just measuring the ratio of their deflections. That measures the geometry of the universe. That measures how much the universe has expanded from this, from this point to this point. The cute thing about it is by taking the ratio, you actually don't even need to know what this mass is. All you need to have is a deflector, right? Because the, the ratio is independent of the bending of the mass. Okay. These ideas have led many groups to propose projects that are working <coughs> on this, uh, this follow-up. The Deep Lens Survey is just completed as observing. The Subaru Deep Survey it's unclear whether it's completed yet. They're, they're pretty mum on whether they're done or not. But you can see that people are making a jump in the next few years in the area covered. What they've chosen to do is to use their cameras to go wider but shallower. They're not going to go to 26 and a half. They're going to go to 24 and a half, but cover a larger area. If you go further up in time, 10 years down the line, LSST, which you'll hear a lot more about next night, uh, is going to go about the same depth, but cover half the sky. Mm. And the project that I'm going to tell you a little bit about is going to cover a smaller portion of the sky, but do it in the near infrared. And the way to do it in the near infrared is to go to space. So here's LSST. Okay. This is the design as it was a few months ago, so I believe the telescope's now need from three meter, but the, the key aspect is this. They've finally gone back to designing big, wide focal lengths. <coughs> because now you can build a 10 gigapixel camera and stick it in that focal plane and get 10 square degrees every shot. The, this is still not feasible, but hopefully will be by the time the telescope flies. And the idea is that every point in the sky gets imaged every two weeks to R24. And then you just keep imaging. What I'm going to talk about is space-based missions. The question is why to go to space, and there are three reasons, of which the first two are really the important ones. Human <coughs> LSST is going to have a problem with the smallest of galaxies, because, well, you've got an atmosphere, and that atmosphere is going to distort the images and blur them. You all know about seeing. If you go into space, there's no atmosphere. The blurring is purely created by the diffraction limit of the telescope. And even a moderately sized telescope has a very nice diffraction limit, even in the infrared. Furthermore, there's no atmosphere means that there's no background to deal with. We think of as our, you know, our sky background as increasing as we go to the red and into the near infrared. But that's purely an effect of the atmosphere. It turns out space is darkest between one and two microns. Beyond two microns, what you end up having is zodiacal thermal effects. So you actually start seeing the thermal light off the zodiacal light. And so the sky background actually starts rising slowly. And the third, of course, is of course you get a full duty cycle, right? There are no clouds. The reason why not is a big reason why not. And this is the reason why no one is planning to do LSST in space. It is really hideously expensive. And it is hideously expensive to send the comparable equipment into space. If you put an 8 meter into space, that's billions of dollars. What I'm going to talk about today is Destiny. Uh, there are a couple missions that I've been working with. Um, Destiny is only a 1.6 meter telescope. It's not a huge telescope. Uh, with a 0.15 square degree field of view compared to 10 square degrees. So it's nowhere near as big as LSST. But still, with a 1.6 meter telescope, our diffraction limits around 0.15 arc seconds from J isn't too bad. The thing that makes Destiny really cool from my point of view is that, yeah, it's got an imager, but it's going to have a grism or a prism. And what that means is that you can take a spectrum of everything. That's wonderful. You take an, a picture and you get a spectrum of everything in the picture. All the redshifts, everything. It's also hideously problematic because You've got a spectrum of everything, and everything overlaps. But you can play tricks. If you take the image of everything and rotate your camera, you get different sets of overlaps. With enough rotations, you can actually reconstruct the pictures. In particular, if the things have emission lines, you do very well. What's a grism? A grism is a grating 
stuck in front of their focal plane. So you're basically oh. sticking a grating in front of your focal plane in order to disperse the light from every single object at okay. once. So rather than doing slit spectroscopy, you do full field spectroscopy. Again, this it wins you a tremendous multiplexing advantage. You're getting spectra of millions of things at a time, but makes your data analysis kind of nasty. Nevertheless, if you want to ever do dark energy with gravitational lensing, if you want to get those red chips to measure the, the expansion of space, this is the way to do it, because this will give you the distances to everything in addition to their shapes. So you take an image and take a grism image, longer exposure, sure, of the same region of the sky, and you're done. <coughs> Destiny is one of four candidate JDEM missions. JDEM stands for Joint Dark Energy Mission. It's a joint uh, Department of Energy and NASA initiative. Uh, joint, not in the sense that they are collaborating very strongly, but joint in the sense that they aren't killing each other yet. They have very different visions of how to actually implement this. Plan. And the plan is to launch something in the 2012 range. So what, what Destiny, for example, has just won is study funds to build a prototype uh, model for the telescope for the full proposal. And the idea is to do a three-year mission to measure the dark energy using both gravitational lensing and supernovae. Because as you might imagine, if you take a grism spectrum of everything in the sky and you get a supernova, you'll get some additional light. There, you win completely because you subtract two spectra and what's left is the spectrum of the supernova. So you can actually do image differencing on the grism, which is very neat. And that suggests that we might know the answer in 10 years of what the dark energy is. But I do want to quote, close with a quote. The quote from Douglas Adams, one of my favorite ones. And I'll let you read it. Decide for yourselves. <laughs> Things are weird. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Now, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe is based upon data that further back in time, that is, further back in time, the expansion was slower. Correct. However, because as you go back in time, the universe gets denser. The effect of gravity actually dominates. So if you plot, uh, here, can I pull the lights? Which one is the light switch? Can you go into blackboard mode for sure. just a second? <laughs> wow. Uh, That's a program for grading. <laughs> So, if, you, if you go back in time, so if this is uh, distance and this is velocity, an expanding universe, the velocity is less for a, so you end up with a curve that looks something like this. But as you go back in time, the universe is smaller and it starts to be, to be dominated by gravity again. And so in fact what you see is this. The universe decelerates. There's a, there's a phase in which the universe is decelerating, and then it starts accelerating. Mm -hmm. So actually, this is not kind of kidding, right? Oh, oh that's yeah. what we yeah. assume. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my, my artistic skills are fantastic. So what we've actually started to see is the, ex the decelerating phase in the earlier, earlier years, so right just one and a half. And that gives us some evidence. All right. Yes. With all the uh, research being done in dark matter, are we any closer to knowing the speed of dark? <laughs> Actually, the speed of dark is slow. <laughs> this is not a completely trivial answer. That dark matter is cold, which means it's non-relativistic. So around us, the dark matter in this room is moving at 200 kilometers per second, because that's our motion throughout through the galaxy. So it's moving at small velocities. So it's not a, the speed of cold is 200 kilometers. <laughs>